Janet. I want to welcome everybody here and also our distinguished panelists uh, who I'll be introducing in a second. I also want to add to my um, bio, I have to plug this, that we're starting a graduate media studies program at Pratt Institute. So students who are coming up and interested in graduate studies um, should check that out. It's going to be very exciting. Um, I also I want to just say a couple of very brief words about um, the internet. It's been 20 years since we've um, had one or since the public has had access to it. And um, that seems to me that uh, it seems to me that there are still a lot of very exciting beginnings uh, taking place. Um, and uh, the innovators at this table are among uh, those who are embarking on new projects and really interesting projects. But we're also facing some endings, I suppose. Um, among them, um, endings about the night, kind of the naivete about privacy and also about the non-corporate and post-identitarian post character of uh, the internet. Um, and also, I mean, in certain fantasies that the internet would be <clears throat> something like an anti-racist, feminist, queer, prison abolitionist, socialist utopia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's not that exactly, um, although some of us are, are working to change that as well. Um, but this disenchantment or maturation, um, depending upon how you want to think about it, with um, online activity uh, brings us to tonight's uh, question, which I think is really an interesting and urgent one. Um, it's an issue or it really, I think it really is a question about digital community formation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at the end of the table and introduce the panelists and then I guess we'll go back uh, and uh, each, each of the panelists will say something about uh, their current work um, and uh, then we'll start with a couple of questions. I mean, I guess maybe I'll ask the first one, but very quick, shortly, we'll open it up to you all so you can ask questions. And while I'm thinking about that, I do want to ask you that when you do um, sort of uh, make your um, presence known by, and ask something, that you use the microphone. We are recording this and archiving it, um, and we want to have exactly what you say on tape forever. So, <laughs> so, so, so if you don't mind, um, please help us out with that. Um, okay, so to my extreme right here, we have Gail Drakes. Um, Gail is an interdisciplinary scholar in history and American studies focusing on the cultural implications of intellectual property law and African-American historical memory. She previously served as a consultant, the social justice philanthropy portfolio at the Ford Foundation, and as the program officer for the Out Fund at Funding Exchange, an activist advised fund which supported LGBTQI-led social justice organizing efforts. Next to her, we have Brittany Cooper. Um, Brittany is an assistant professor of women's and Gender Studies and Africana Studies at Rutgers University. She is co-founder of and blogger for the Crunk Feminist Collective and is at work on her first book project, Race, Women, Gender, and the Making of a Black Public Intellectual Tradition, 1831 to the Present. Next to Brittany, we have Courtney E. Martin, who is um, 402, is that correct? That's right. All right. She is an author, blogger, and speaker. Her most recent book, Project Rebirth, Survival and the Strength of the Human Spirit from 9-11 Survivors, was published last fall. She is editor emeritus at feministing.com, founding director of the Solutions Journalism Network, partner at Valenti Martin Media, a social media strategy firm, and is currently collaborating with BCRW on a project to further the sustainability and impact of online feminism. Next to Courtney is Renina Jarman. She's a scholar, instructor, blogger at um, newmodelminority.com, and a curator of digital black feminisms. She is currently pursuing a doctoral degree in women's studies at the University of Maryland. Her research interests are women's sexuality in popular culture and the retention of black women within STEM careers. And uh, next to me is Dana Goldstein, who is a journalist and writes about education, politics, women's issues, cities, and public health. She is also a Schwartz Fellow at the New Amer American Foundation and a Puffin Fellow at the Na Nation Institute. She is at work on a book about the political history of American public school teaching and was previously an associate editor at the Daily Beast and the American Prospect. So uh, these are our panelists. Um, and I guess we'll just go to you, Gail, if you would say a little bit about your work and the issues you see central to us. Well, I know that it was kind of a concern to ask someone who's engaged in academic work, like say, just the one thing that you think is important. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Um, but I guess I'll just want to say something that's, I don't think it'll be controversial, but I think it's really important, um, which is the importance of 
the importance of really bringing a feminist analysis to the entire picture of digital community. So that is to say that I'm really hoping in general and in this conversation, we can not only talk about the possibilities of creating feminist community online, but using the tools and insights of feminism, of critical race theory, to bringing that to bear on the way we think about digital community formation more generally. Um, I think I was reminded, and I think we're gonna hopefully talk about Twittergate, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, I was recently reminded that not everyone who's talking about digital humanities and talking about digital um, communities are thinking in a way, they're not yet still using that lens, and it really does make a, a significant difference. Um, just to say something briefly about my work um, and something that this um, conversation, kind of preparing for this made me think about, um, I show a film to my students, um, I should mention in the bio that I also um, I'm an associate faculty member and advisor at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at New York University. So I'm downtown teaching, and one of the classes that one of the films that I use and I show to the students is called Copyright Criminals. <clears throat> and it's a moment in this film that's very difficult and complicated for me, in which a musician who's really well known for his um, remix and sampling, he's talking about his relationship to the um, to the things, to the, the products that he uses to create his art. And he says, all of them belong to me. All of them are in my band. John Coltrane, he's in my band. James Brown, he's in my band. Like with this kind of possessive sense of like all the fruits of this black labor with his playground to do with what, what he wanted. And there wasn't that kind of larger context of what that meant. Um, so I think that as in the discussion of the intellectual property law, more generally, as they relate to sampling, and I think especially in regards to this um, question of digital community formation, um, when it came to Twittergate, it seemed like those who came into the conversation with the understanding of questions of power and difference and authority and voice tended to have a very different opinion about whether or not that conversation was important or whether or not it was silly. So I just want us to just think about the, those tools and insights that we bring just as feminists and as people who are thinking critically about race um, relate to all aspects of the conversation and not just the ones that we specifically label as feminists. Thank you, Brittany. Good evening. I um, want to say thank you to the Barnard Center for Research on Women, to Ann Jonas uh, for having me here. Um, so a lot of the work that I do really comes from questions about the ways that black women work as knowledge producers and the ways that that knowledge transforms public space. So when black women are present in space, it's this, this old quotation, it's a famous black feminist quotation from Anna Julia Cooper, when and where I enter and the quiet undisputed dignity of my womanhood without um, suing or special patronage then and there, the whole race enters with me. So that quote rings in my ears regularly in part because it's one of the starting points for a book that I'm writing, but also because I think it points to the ways in which black women and women of color in public space doesn't merely suggest a narrative of inclusion, but it's also literally about transforming the logics of how spaces can operate. So I'm interested in what happens when women of color come into a space and start sharing ideas and claim the agency to also produce knowledge on equal footing in that space. Uh, and one of the things that this raises for me, particularly in light of Twittergate, which again, I think we will all be talking about, is I'm not so much interested just in a concept of the public, but in a notion of publics or this idea about community, who are our publics? I think it's multiple, I think it's variable, uh, and I think that we're speaking to different groups at different moments. Uh, and finally, um, one of the things that my work, which really begins in the 1800s does, it just works with this concept of rhetorical community. So one of the things I've argued is that over time, black women always created really rich rhetorical communities where they talked to each other via letters, via the books that they wrote, the speeches that they gave. They found a way to be in community and share ideas, even if it was outside of formal channels. So now that we're in the age and era of digital community, I think that black women and women of color are using similar strategies, but in a really different medium. Uh, and I'm interested in 
how this both how it's both historically continuous and how it's different. Uh, so it's so this sort of move from rhetorical community, which was sustaining, to a kind of digital community, uh, are some of the questions that inform the work I do and the way we think about blogging at the Crunk Feminist Collective. <clears throat> awesome. Um, I also want to echo my thanks to Anne and Catherine and Janet and everyone at Barnard Center for Research on Women, um, and also to say how honored I am to be on this panel of human beings, um, all of whom are people I admire online, and some of whom I've never met on land, so that's exciting. Um, so I guess I'll just say that I think for me, and most of my online feminist experience is through the context of feministing. I'm also a journalist, so I write a lot online, but that's kind of a whole nother animal to me, um, but in this context through feministing, I really think for me it's been um, in this idea of sort of a learning community and I think playing off a little of what Brittany was saying, in a learning com community there are multiple kinds of labor, right? There's the labor of teaching um, and there's also the labor of learning and uh, some of my most difficult moments in digital community at feministing and sort of in the feminist blogosphere has been, have been moments when I've had to learn in public, which I think is a really interesting practice mm -hmm. and one that privileged women like myself in particular um, have a lot of trouble with and need to be more accountable around. And so um, whether it was making an ableist comment or learning something about how something I'd written came off in terms of my economic, socioeconomic class, um, it, it was really transformative for me. It was really painful sometimes and, and I had to do a lot of work around depersonalizing and, and you know walking around the block and taking a deep breath and getting back to the computer and figuring out how to be accountable and how to learn. Um, but that has been a huge growth experience for me and I think made me a better person, definitely made me a, a smarter um, and I think more accountable um, activist and intellectual and all of those things. And it's something I just feel like we're still learning how to do in the feminist blogosphere. I, I still feel like um, young women that I mentor, particularly of privilege, who come into the space are still struggling with what it means to try to be accountable. Um, and that's not something unique to the feminist blogosphere. I think that's unique to women. I mean, that's, you see that in women's studies, you see that in college classrooms, you see that all over but just kind of want to throw that out as a work in progress that I think I've been vulnerably engaged in and have not always done well, but think is really important. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanted to say something about that labor of teaching piece, because I think part of what I'm engaged in now with my partner, Vanessa, is try and Barnard Center for Research and Women, is trying to think through how to make the feminist blogosphere more sustainable. Um, because on this basic level, you have all of these incredible activist intellectual folks doing unpaid labor, um, largely unpaid, you know, there, there's perks here and there, but um, largely unpaid, and it's this huge service, and it's an incredibly important part of the feminist movement now, and yet there's no sustainability to it whatsoever. It's people are burning out all over the place, and the people who are burning out are, you know, surprise, surprise, the least privileged, um, which narrows the, the range of voices you hear, and so, um, the labor of teaching online. I'm thinking a lot about these days and trying to figure out how do we create some sort of model by which people could access support. Um, and also, you know, there's a labor of teaching uh, privileged folks, which is really interesting because part of the beauty of the internet is we've been able to like recruit people into feminism who would have never otherwise stumbled into a women's studies classroom, but they show up with a lot of misconceptions and ignorance and confusion. So we always had these moments in the feminist in comment section where people would say like, well, why is, you know, police brutality a feminist issue? Mm -hmm. And someone has to go about explaining to that person why that's a feminist issue, which is important but exhausting. So. <laughs> Um, you know, that question of, of who has to put the energy out there to constantly explain different things, even as, you know, my goal is always to get those 101 people because I know that's also where change happens. So, um, sort of, those are all my work in progress thoughts, but excited to discuss them more with folks. I also want to say thank you to the Barnard Center for Research on Women for giving all of us the space to discuss these very interesting ideas around digital feminist communities. Um, with regard to my own work, I came to women's studies and feminism through hip hop and looking at representations of black women or black and Latino women in rap music videos. And so for the most part, I focused on um, black women's sexuality and pop culture. Well, now I'm moving into looking at um, what are the ways in which um, 
internet, social media spaces may or may not look different if there were more black women computer scientists. So not only am I I'm thinking about how I and other folks exist on the internet as people who are um, sort of using these spaces to connect, but I'm thinking in terms of the political economy piece, which is who owns these startups, mm -hmm. who's allowed to be in these spaces, and would they look differently, or would we talk about different things um, if they were being created by women, and black women in particular? Thanks. Um, also, just want to say thank you. I'm, I'm really intrigued with what you just said, Renina, because I've recently done some work. I write mostly about public education, and in particular, computer science education and programming mm -hmm. education is not reaching girls of all races, and it's not reaching students of color. So that's something I'm really interested in, beginning with younger children as well. Um, I guess what I'll just say right now is that over the past seven years since I graduated from college, my career has moved from writing primarily for progressive, explicitly progressive or liberal publications like The American Prospect and The Nation to writing more frequently in more mainstream spaces like The Atlantic and Slate. I was an editor at The Daily Beast, which is now The Daily Beast Newsweek. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some experience with sort of pitching ideas about progressive politics um, in those more familiar spaces and then also in spaces that brand themselves as non-ideological. Um, and it's been interesting to me um, to see how I feel like my own work is both strengthened and sometimes also compromised by having to make that transition. I think there's a lot of pros and cons, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that if that interests people during the Q&A. Um, I really totally identify with what Courtney was saying about the learning process. I think in journalism, we're moving to a model where we, we show our work. <laughs> I, get, I like think of that analogy from when you're doing a math problem and you're carrying the numbers and showing mm -hmm. the steps. So by tweeting and by blogging about doing shorter form versions of what might eventually be, say, an 8,000 word feature story in the Atlantic, <laughs> you're able to sort of pick up a lot of feedback mm -hmm. along the way. So, some, so sometimes the feedback I pick up reflects on my own biases coming to a story as the person I am, as Courtney was saying, but sometimes it's something so simple as I've missed something really important about a topic, someone important I should speak to, an expert that I haven't known about that I ought to know, and I actually find this process improves my work so much that now that I'm writing a book that I have two years to work on, I'm actually struggling with not having that avenue anymore because it's such a long process and I've been warned that I shouldn't really put too much of it out there before the book's publication. And now I'm actually wondering, are there huge flaws or weaknesses <laughs> in this work that I'm not going to know about? So I think while at times this learning in public aspect can be really painful, I've actually become totally addicted to it. And uh, all in all, I think it's a good thing. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, and um, I'm just going to throw a question out there. and. Everyone will figure out how they're, and who, and the order they want to answer it. I don't really want to like, be the one to decide who talks. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's somehow fundamentally wrong. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask a question based on what you said and also drawing from some of the questions that were uh, posed uh, on, online. I mean, it seems to me that some of the issues that you brought up, just to recap quickly, and I'm gonna sort of conflate a few things here, uh, that um, underpin this issue of community are power, authority, uh, voice and property, uh, rhetoric, the role of rhetoric and, and rhetorical communities, um, space, the organization and logistics of space, one might even say the racialization and gendering of space, uh, questions about labor, paid and unpaid, um, who, both in terms of the production of actual internet spaces and communities, but also uh, in terms of the labor of, of educating our peers and ourselves. Um, this issue of learning, I think, is really central um, to uh, thinking about community because it also suggests that community is not only extrinsic but, but intrinsic in, in very important ways and that, in fact, um, our own consciousness or subjectivity, call it what you will, is communitarian in, in character and perhaps more so uh, within a digital context. Um, I think also the issue of political economy is, is key um, and the whole question of what kinds of structural um, logics, gendered and raced, are implicit in the machines that we use. 
uh, seems to me to be a fundamental question of our moment, actually, and to dis kind of disentangle the various racisms and sexisms which um, are endemic to the functioning of machines, I think, is something that we're beginning to work on, but there's a tremendous amount to be done. Also, this issue of writing, right? Whether it's journalism or writing of any kind, the whole textualization of our lives seems to me to be a fundamental piece of this as well. So um, my question, uh, after all this seemingly complex stuff, is kind of simple in some ways, but I think it will take us places, or at least I hope it will. Uh, I would ask you to um, reflect for a moment on what is community now? I mean, is community, um, does it require a new definition? I mean, how does it sort of um, uh, signify with some of its other uh, words that are closer to it, like um, communion, for example, or you know, other others you can think of? Um, and uh, then if you might want to uh, say something about how you think about community, then perhaps you could uh, develop that, your thoughts um, with, uh, in the following way. Uh, how does one build community, and maybe why does one build community? You know, for us at the CFC, the one thing that I can say about that, it's a tough question, um, but I think for us it was something really basic, which was recognition. So, um, Melissa Harris Perry has a new book out called Sister Citizen, where she argues that recognition is really a fundamental aspect of um, how we understand ourselves working in a body politics. So we don't just want to participate, but we want people to recognize our humanity. And so I remember, so it's that moment when you read a blog post and someone gets it, the thing that you need them to get, whatever it is, you read it and all of a sudden there's space for who you are or how you move through the world. There's a perspective that you've always had and you thought, Finally, somebody said it, you know, I, I didn't realize I was the only one who thought this way or had this impression. And when we first started writing at the Crunk Feminist Collective, that is what the, the nature of the comments that we got were. Mm -hmm. Women coming to us and saying, thank you. You know, we're so happy that someone named this perspective or, you know, you know for instance, that you can go to the club and get crunk, drop it like it's hot, and still be a feminist, which is it was sort of the tenor and is the tenor of the kind of things that we do. And so I think that whatever we decide or think community is, that when people feel recognized, they feel like you see them. And it's really interesting in virtual terms to talk about seeing people. But I think particularly for black women who feel invisible often, and I think for any other marginalized group that feels that some critical aspect of their identity is invisible, that to be seen is like a critical prerequisite to commune with folks. I guess I'll just add in. I think I was thinking a lot about the question of community this weekend. because I was in part of a conference that was talking about civic engagement in higher education and kind of bringing together campus and community, communities, um, what exactly all that meant. And part of what I was talking about in that space was kind of historical and sociological perspectives on community. So like thinking of a neighborhood as a place and a community as an experience, right? So the question is then, the ways in which digital formations, these kind of online sites can create a space in which a certain experience happens. And I think that the question for, I think one of the challenges we face in terms of this idea of digital community is thinking of that experience as something that in part happens in an online space and then thinking about how that translates to kind of offline spaces and back and forth. And I think there's too much of this idea, like if you build it, they will come. You'll have a website and it's there, but a lot of websites just kind of languish. There's not community of, of any nature connected with most websites, even those made with a lot of passion and a lot of love. And I think a lot more attention needs to be focused on not just the code, but the community aspect, figuring out what um, that looks like. And I think a significant part of it is about putting the site, putting the online site as part of a larger in a larger context. And that's the website as part of a larger web, for lack of a different metaphor, a larger web of objects and texts and spaces and interactions. Um, and I think a lot of times that's what's missing. We kind of build the site and you know, we figure out how we're gonna manage our comment section and that's the it, that's it. 
But what about the relationship between sites? And what about you know, the ways in which we make those connections that either are born or grow online have a life elsewhere? Can I add one thing that I forgot to say? Um, the other thing about the Crunk Feminist Collective that I think matters and resonates for people in terms of community is that we're a community of writers. So when we came together, they were like, who are these crunks? Who are the crunks? Who are y'all? And what, what, you know, so they, they knew that there was like a crew that was doing it, and I think that resonated with people. So we get all these requests from people to be part of the crew. Uh, <laughs> and one of the things that we've said, you know, is that particularly in light of some of the things Courtney mentioned about sustainability, the crew is a sort of fixed group of people um, that we take, care, we take care of each other, you know, but I think that that models for other folks. So I think it's very attractive to people that there is a group of us, that there's not just one. So for some reason, I think that part of the reason we were able to build community is because we had already built community with each other, and then it showed up in the way that we wrote. Um, and talked about things and the diversity of perspectives. <clears throat> yeah, that's very true, I think, of feministing also, is that we are a community of friends offline, but also, interestingly, we started the community, <clears throat> excuse me, community vertical, so that's a place that anyone can post. Um, so there's kind of the homepage and then the community, we literally call it the community site, so this question of community is really interesting. And um, it's been really moving to see the kinds of material people put there and um, and to know that for so many people there is this deep yearning for a crew and even if we can't cohesively offer them the crewness because we can only handle so many relationships at once and like coordinate, coordinating at once, we can offer that platform place where people have some sense of what's expected in that space and they can participate. Um, and we've had a lot of people who've written there and gotten you know media calls and created different kinds of actions online, like things have really happened for them in a, in a very cool way. So I think it's one of the things we're most proud of at Feministing in terms of creating some secondary space where people can participate even if they're not regular editors and bloggers, which just takes a tremendous amount of energy. Um, and I wanted to say, this is a little outside of the feminist world, but one of the coolest online communities I've seen that I wrote about um, is called the Harry Potter Alliance, and it's little, like Harry Potter fans all over the world who mm -hmm. aggregated online and have created these amazing communities and now they're sort of applying what's going on in, in the real world to themes in the book and taking action collectively together. Um, and I bring that up because I was so impressed with their capacity to bridge the voice you know, recognition piece that Brittany was talking about and then the action piece because I think that's for me one of the learning curves I'm still on is like how do we really create action and to take that even a step further, how do we create action within a community that's not just reacting against things, against Rush Limbaugh, against, you know, Komen, against, 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 but for a vision of the kind of world we all want to live in? Because I think we do that in voice online a lot, but in action it's sort of hard to figure out that next step. Can I just do a plus one to the Harry Potter Alliance? Like, that's really, they're really amazing, Aren't I have they? to say. Because, I mean, and then one of the more recent things, I mean, that they've done that caught my attention was, okay, so they're in celebration of imaginary character. Okay, yeah. so, so that's number one. Like, we are an alliance in support of this imaginary character. And they come together and they, you know, there's kind of a social justice lens that mm -hmm. comes to it because one of the things that um, happened this summer, they were working together to do kind of like flyers and stuff at the release of The Hunger Games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So The Hunger Games fictional book about, you know, this dystopic reality in which teenagers are killing each other, you know, in service of the state. So they come together and talk about real life hunger, like at the, mm -hmm. at the screenings. Mm -hmm. Now what was interesting in that situation is that they were told they couldn't do that. They couldn't do flyers on behalf of Oxfam trying to end hunger because it was messing with the branding that, you know, that the Hunger Games and Merrimax had a certain thing they were trying to do and fighting hunger via, via fighting child hunger via Oxfam and the work yeah. of the Harry Potter Alliance was not mm -hmm. part of that. Um, but I just thought it was amazing. Well, that, you Gail, know. it's so funny bringing that up because it's actually my article that made that happen, which, which actually turned out to be awesome because, so I wrote this piece for the New York Times, Lionsgate found out about it, mm -hmm. sent a cease and desist letter to the Harry Potter Alliance and said, you have to stop this right away. And they wrote back and said, really? And, and put <laughs> a change.org petition so. up. And it was the fastest growing change.org petition in history, like the number of hours to get to thousands and thousands. And, 
And so Lionsgate contacted them like 12 hours later and said, in fact, we rescind the cease and desist letter. <laughs> we would really love to work with you on future Hunger Games mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. So it was like an amazing mm -hmm. reversal of power, um, which is kind of what I mean. Like, what yeah. is the feminist version of that? Like, I want to make Lionsgate cease and desist on something. <laughs> on many levels. On many levels. That's a good target. Exactly. And that was one of the few moments that I was excited about a change.org petition. Yeah. I think we would mention <laughs> yeah. that I should say they're actually called Imagine Better. The Harry Potter Alliance morphed into this thing called Imagine Better so that they can apply to all kinds of young adult phenomenons, not just Harry Potter. So if people want to look them up and see what they're doing, that's what they're calling themselves. Other reflections on community formation? I think that... Um, the first thing that comes to mind is a comment that someone left on my blog maybe a month or so ago. And she essentially said um, that she hadn't responded because she couldn't get her ideas together. But she didn't want me to think that because she hadn't responded, it didn't mean that she wasn't thinking about it. And for me, what was material about that is that I wrote something that clearly resonated with her and that she was like struggling with it internally and eventually came back and we had a conversation about it. So um, with regard to community, I think oftentimes about how transformative it can be, right? And that moment in which you write something, if I'm like sitting on my bed at home, I'm writing, you have no idea whether or not people are gonna care. You have absolutely no idea, but we still do it anyways, right? So that's what's... It's sort of like there's this, um, there's this potential there that you don't know until you do it. And then even if you have an impact on people, sometimes they don't even tell you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So there's this notion of faith, I think, that's an undercurrent. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, speaking as a journalist, one of the ways I think about community is how different publications deal with their comment sections. Mm -hmm. And I've mm -hmm. noticed a real difference in terms of the quality of the dialogue and level of civility um, and the, the range of publications that I write for. Um, and I also have some experience, I've been, I have been maintaining my own personal blog which has its own community since mm -hmm. 2006, so I've also had experience with building that up and so I know it takes very active comment moderation and also just to be in your own comment section and respond. And that's something I do, like when I write for Slate. They actually have a very civil comments section um, and do a pretty good job moderating it. You have to authenticate with some other sort of Facebook or Twitter. You, you mm -hmm. have to show that you're a real person, essentially, mm -hmm. which has its ups and, there's ups and downs to that. But um, when I go into the comment sections and respond to critiques of my work or questions about my work, I notice that the commenters all of a sudden like their tone just becomes nicer and warmer mm. and they're really surprised that the writer of the article is there interacting with them. So I've promised myself to, to be more a part of those communities and I think that in journalism over the last 10, 15 years, it's been a really big shift for journalists to feel that they have to be constantly receiving feedback on their work. I mean, before work journalism was posted online, there could be letters to the editor, but the number of people who would actually take the trouble to do that would be pretty slim. And now, even in a small publication that gets very few readers, you will see feedback to your work. So I think, I think it's a good thing, but it's a shift. And that different publications have embraced it or resisted it to different extents, and that's been interesting for me. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a really fascinating discussion. I'm, 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 I'm so blown away by what you all are saying. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm going to try to ask one more question, then I'm done. So it's up to everybody else to ask uh, questions of our panelists. But um, the, you know, the, this idea of recognition, which many of you are talking about, or, or the fact that someone took the time to write to you and say, well, I'm still thinking about this, mm -hmm. it, it reminds us of the fact that you know, building community is actually, communities don't just exist out there. They don't, they're just, just not sort of like something that's laying inert and then you go find them. It's actually praxis, right? I mean, communities are, are organized and made and there's a whole process of making which seems to me to be absolutely central to um, what we're all doing and we're, what we're all interested in. But there's also like a, a difficult and I would even say uh, potentially sinister side 
uh, to this praxis, which has to do with um, the expropriation of these practices, practices right? I mean, uh, on the one hand, I mean, the famous example, of course, is the Arab Spring, right? And the use of Facebook and Twitter and how important those uh, platforms were for um, organizing. Um, some people want to emphasize that more. Some people say, well, let's be a little bit more critical about the way we laud the the function of the internet. But whatever your position on that, there's also this uh, other side which has to do with um, monetization, right? Mm -hmm. and, and which is, uh, in some people's view, um, mine included, I suppose, a kind of expropriation uh, in which um, you have all of these desires for uh, progressive, even utopian transformation uh, that have a political edge and are really working against the uh, kind of um, history of uh, of violence and oppression, which um, has so profoundly structured um, the present. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's this presence of um, the social factory, the post-Fordist uh, moment, in which all of these um, activities, which are emotive and internal and passionate and powerful, are also building these structures which are alien and alienated in certain ways. So yeah. I don't know if you, if you think about that, and I'm, but I'm, I'm sure you do, but I just want to sort of put that out there for, for your comments. I think there are a couple things to say about it. When you, when you talked about it, the things that I think about are, so I'll give you an example since we're the Kronk Feminist Collective. Uh, I had to get Kronk with someone today <laughs> on the blog. Um, I wrote a product review um, for uh, like a body butter line that was oh, nice. that started by Joan Morgan, who's one of the founders of hip hop feminism. Oh, nice. So there's would be no Kronk Feminist Collective without mm -hmm. Joan Morgan and her work. Mm -hmm. And this commenter came over and started talking real sideways to me about how we shouldn't you know, is this the way that the CFC is going? Y'all are doing product endorsements now. And I was in a meeting and I was <laughs> like, I need to leave this meeting because <laughs> what is happening? You know, I was ready to just handle her. Like, and so there are a couple of things with that. So first was, you know, and I did handle her. Like I went home and I was like, we're, not, we're a blog, not, you know, she said we, we wouldn't be a source of credible journalism. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, but we're a blog that blogs for a particular community. We're not a newspaper, mm -hmm. but that had to be clarified. But then I also, so there's that, right, which is what expectations do people have of mm -hmm. you in the community about the kind of content you're trying to provide? But like, y'all will be proud because one of the things I didn't do was remind her that what we do, we do for free. No mm -hmm. one pays us to do any of it, so we can do whatever we want to do because it's ours, you know? And so I had to sort of have a feminist moment of like, but these people are in your community, they read you, you have to be accountable to them. But sometimes I wish that that accountability would be reciprocated in that when you are the beneficiary of lots and lots of people's free labor, mm -hmm. sometimes folks forget that there are people mm -hmm. behind the content. Mm -hmm. And so we've really had, you know, so I'm always getting people at, mad at, on the blog, that's one of the things I do as Crunktastic, and that's fine. <laughs> but one of the things that we talk a lot about is not just the sustainability of that teaching labor, or the sustainability of the teaching labor, but the emotional labor. Yes. And it's the affective labor. Yeah, and it's and it's even more, you know, and then it's exacerbated by the fact that then we're women of color. All of us at the blog are women of color. We have one man of color who blogs for us. Um, and so folks then expect it doubly uh, or in multiple ways. Um, and so, and, and, and then the other thing is not even just when it's like a racial issue where people want you to do it because you're a person of color, but also other people of color come and they need the work to, they needed to do so much emotional labor for them around recognition. And so there was this like, so when people write to us, rarely is it like the trollish comments, it's the, I'm so disappointed in you. Mm because you didn't up, you know, you know, live up to my standards mm -hmm. um, of the kind of content that I think you should be producing. And so, so there are all of these issues about emotional labor, unpaid labor, um, you know, and, and, and the last thing I'll say about it is this other point you made, Courtney, about not wanting to be reactive. So one of the mm -hmm. things that we found at the CFC is that people love it when we're going the fuck off on folks. Excuse mm -hmm. the language, but that's, that's what they like. They like it when we're real crunk and angry. Um, mm -hmm. But then I think about, like, you know, 
I'm an overweight black woman, right? So there, the, you know, there are, and I, and I own that because that's part of what it means to be in community. But when we think about what it means to be academics, which is a hostile space for black women, um, to do feminist work, which doesn't go well often with black men, uh, it sometimes does, but frequently it does not. So we're already doing that kind of work. Then we're trying to take care of ourselves. And so what I don't need to do is be stressed and have the cortisol levels running rampant all the time in a body that, you know, I'm trying to work to make as healthy as I possibly can, right? And that's the sort of physical labor that folks also kind of don't acknowledge or that we don't have a way to think about it. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about this year at the CFC, one of the changes because we want to be less reactive, because it's not healthy. And folks want us to come be the police. We get email. Did, did you did you see <laughs> that someone said this thing? It's like, well, you'll say something. You'll say yeah. something. <laughs> you know? So anyway, um, we want to be less reactive, and we want to put forward affirmative content about the kind of world we want to create, mm -hmm. and not just about people who are not doing the stuff that we think they ought to be doing. And that's hard if you feel like your community comes to you, because what they want you to do is do the emotional labor that they don't have the platform of the outlet or the language to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is I think this is really important what you said about being in a meeting and getting the angry <laughs> comment or email and feeling the need to get right at. Mm -hmm. I just noticed that um, when I went on vacation for 10 days and I didn't check my email the entire time, mm. I felt I didn't feel just feel less stressed, which I expected, but I actually felt physically different. <laughs> Um, and so I think one of the important things to do is as if you become very active in online work, it's to have times where you're not online. Um, and I find <laughs> that can sort of chill you out, and especially because some of the labor is unpaid or not well paid. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I just wanted to mention about the labor aspects of this is I've noticed, you know, a lot of male bloggers or writers have other people that write under their names. And I've noticed this is not a frequent practice for female writers. Um, and I just, I think that's really interesting. There's a lot of really famous male writers who have eponymous blogs who actually, <laughs> there are actually four or five people who are some of these folks whose names I won't mention, but I just, it's been interesting to me as I think about how much time do I have for longer form types of writing and how do I balance that with an active online presence that is that where I can re be reactive when I feel like I need to be reactive. That um, I find that if I want to retain sort of control and um, if I want to feel fully engaged in what I'm doing in these different genres, it, it's very limiting. But I, I, w I feel comfortable mm -hmm. with that, but it's a different bargain for every writer, I think. It's interesting that you brought that up, Dana, because I was actually just sitting here thinking about that we haven't talked about the intergenerational issues around this topic, and um, I, I've had experiences of a lot of older feminists not recognizing this as real labor, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's starting to change. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're sort of hitting this tipping point where there's more awareness of that, like, this whole blogging thing is real. It's not just, you know, young feminists wasting our time talking about our sex lives or, you know, all those like perceptions. Um, but also, interestingly, part of the way I've paid for my blogging is by doing social media consulting and ghostwriting. So I've ghostwritten mm -hmm. pieces for people that, like, for example, I'll be on a listserv with them and it's like a feminist community and I'll be like, yay, so-and-so had this op-ed published, and secretly I wrote the op-ed, and it's a very bizarre experience of being like, like it's paid, so that's cool, because I can pay my rent with it, but at the same time, this question about sort of voice, and this is within the feminist movement, mm -hmm. so there are like, you know, multiple older feminists who have ghostwriters, I have been them, I am not them right now, but like that's, I don't know, I just think that's kind of interesting to think about, that, you know, I don't think there are a lot of women bloggers who have ghostwriters, but I do think a lot of the most prominent feminist public intellectuals yeah. have ghostwriters, and no one really talks about it. Yeah. That's just really interesting because of the ways in which that masks um, how labor mm -hmm. is being produced and reproduced, and this idea of social capital. Um, that's not what I planned on talking about right now, <laughs> but I just I needed to mark that moment. Um, in terms of the intergenerational piece, that applies to me in that I had a conversation with this 
fabulous black woman historian, Elsa Barkley Brown at Maryland, who I've worked with. And I'm talking to her because I want to talk about digital feminisms in my work. But I was real clear in that I said, this is the thing that makes me happy. And I'm scared that if I bring it into the more formal academic spaces, mm -hmm. I am not gonna like it anymore. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it was really real, right? <laughs> and she was like, well, very thoughtful. She said, well, I, um, I want you to think very carefully about whether or not you want to do this. I think that it's an excellent topic. And I was like, oh man, she's gonna want me to do this. This is an excellent topic because it's dynamic and you're clearly invested. Um, and she also said that it's, a legitimate, it's legitimate if I choose not to, but she doesn't want me to not choose to do it out of fear. And so right now I'm like working through mm -hmm. how do I do this because it's something that I hold so dear that I don't want to end up hating, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. See, y'all, <laughs> see, now we're all like, whatever kind of script we thought we had, now it's just all off-road now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there's just so much interesting, I think, to what you guys are saying. I think that what is making me, in the initial question, it was a reference to money and monetizing, and I think mm -hmm. that, what I'm thinking about is how notions of value change and kind of creation and production of different kinds of value, which is not always about money. So coming back to this idea of personal branding mm -hmm. and identity as property. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the ghostwriting that you're referring to, like identity as transferable property. Mm -hmm. And so when, in my class, we're, you know, they kind of come in wanting to talk about copyright and IP and kind of some of them are there because they want to be lawyers and some of them are there because they're artists and like, how can I protect myself? Mm -hmm. You know, but then the conversation necessarily shifts to what is the nature of authorship? What's the nat nature of ownership? Like these kind of fundamental questions. And then by midterm, they're like, why are we talking about slavery? Why are we talking mm -hmm. about that? Well, we can't really talk about the nature of intellectual property or property or identity as property or Twitter. We can't talk about Twitter without slavery. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea of this kind of identity as property, I think is really important. And I think personally for me also, and it's part of this may be intergenerational as well, but when I was kind of asking around, like, okay, I wanna make this move into social media, what, do, what, what should that look like? What concerns should I have, like asking around? A lot of it came down to this idea of needing to narrow myself down into a identity that was easily identifiable. Like you mm -hmm. have to be, about being this, you have to be about being, you know, either you're a black feminist or you're this or you're that, mm -hmm. and it's gotta be clear, and you can't have a blog about everything, you have to have a blog about a particular yes. like brand that you're yes. gonna push forward and you're gonna move. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then the question of like, are you anonymous or use your name and what that controls, what you can say. And I found that I ended up having a certain amount of resistance to participating in social media because social media was just another space where I couldn't bring the fullness of myself. Mm. Like in so many other spaces, I'm too much of this, you're too much of that. And like now I have to come on here and you, I'm gonna lose followers because you don't wanna hear my tweets on Galaxy Quest <laughs> or cause I spoke too much about philanthropy and not enough of higher ed that day. And it's like, I'm not here for another siloed space where I can't bring the fullness of who I am. Mm. So the question is, and then also we didn't even talk about, and I don't know that we need to, but just to say that we've talked about a lot of really particularly safe and safer and beautiful spaces that these um, women have helped create online. And you know, that's not true for all the spaces and the anonymous comment sections that make oh, yeah. my laptop a fearsome place. Like I have to back away from my laptop. I had to make a, like a pact with myself. Like don't look at the comment sections on that, on that story because you know what it's gonna say. And so that it's, a complicated, it's a complicated idea. And this idea of identity as property and mm. how you have to narrow yourself and make yourself smaller in something as large as the World Wide Web is unendingly fascinating to me and sad sometimes. Thank you, Gail. I mean, these, these are obviously uh, really fascinating comments. Um, I'm gonna ask people in the audience um, to uh, say, uh, to comment or to que ask questions as they like. Thank you to all of you. Um, now that some time has passed, what do you think were the primary actionable 
lessons from the racial fallout of the slut walk here in New York City? Because that was a live incident that had a lot of discussion and repercussions and conversations that could have been fruitful collapse <laughs> online. Um, especially as we talk about trying to develop spaces with all the different things that you've all brought up about not being, the, not being able to be women of multiple narratives and having to brand yourself and niche yourself. But then what does that mean for trying to create a digital community online where fem, you know, feminists across difference can actually have safe spaces to have difficult conversations? Mm. Hi, Sophia. <laughs> See, that's community. That's I, community. No, this is like one of my she wrote moments. <laughs> um, Sophia is a blogger who I read. She's a hip hop feminist extraordinaire. And I. <laughs> You're working the blonde, girl. Um, you know, my thoughts on Slut Walk are complicated. Um, so I'd say a couple of things. The thing that it probably taught me is the potential of the space. Mm -hmm. So the most powerful moments for me were when the CFC came out and said, we're not attending this. Uh, we're, you know, we don't, we don't know that this is gonna be useful for black women um, in general. Um, and organizers of slut walks came to the comments section and some talked sideways, but most earnestly engaged and really sought to listen and used it to transform the kind of work that they did. Mm -hmm. And then came, this year we got an invitation to come and speak at Slut Walk DC. Now, we decided not to go uh, because we just didn't want to, we didn't want the formal association, mm -hmm. um, which is a tough thing. And so here's the thing that, so what I liked was the potential for engagement and it made me know that sometimes it's hard, right? Because I do think that white feminists are trying. I do think that they are trying and I saw that. I think that my critique, one of the things that mattered to me in the critique though, that I felt got lost is that one of the things I wanted to push was the notion that maybe what feminist political organizing looks like now is that we have the tools to say if slut is used against a community of women in this way, even if they're white women, they have the right to organize around that usage. And that's a feminist issue that we can be in solidarity with as long as it's connected to other struggles like policing, which then affects communities of color. So to say that I, I, I didn't think that, and, and you know, and there were differences of opinion. To say that, I, that at the CFC, we didn't necessarily think black and brown women should, you know, do this sort of slut performance was not to say that we didn't think that there was a, an issue that deserved to be addressed. And one of the things I felt like was that when the critiques happened, we got disillusioned, everyone got disillusioned and stopped. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the thing that we wanted to have happen. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted the, you know, we thought we're sophisticated enough now that we can adapt and expand. And, and this becomes this question of virtual reality versus political reality. All that happens on social media is adaption, ad adaptation and expansion. We do it so quickly, but in real life, we can't seem to figure it out. And I felt like that was an unfortunate side effect. You know, so the question then became, do you not make the critique because you believe in the movement? Like, I believe in the movement. I could have slapped the Toronto police officer. <laughs> that was ridiculous. I don't think that makes the world safer for women. But at the same time, I wanted white women to understand that them dressing up like a slut and walking down the street was gonna be qualitatively different from somebody like me dressing up and doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't understand why coming to that understanding derail, you know, contributed to the, to the loss of momentum behind a movement that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this. There's um, a million interesting things that I'm hearing, but I was particularly thinking about the idea of um, having, um, not being able to be like your fully expressed self online and in social media, um, pr blogging, particularly because knowing like, okay, these comments are gonna come at me in all sorts of ways that are some, in some ways very legitimate and in other ways completely um, irrelevant and just um, attacking me. And also too, thinking about, it made me bring, bring up the idea is something I'm thinking about or I have been thinking about over time as like, you know, depending on what you do for a living, 
do you, you know, writing under your full name, writing under a pseudonym, you know, what, what are the different kinds of mo ways in which we move in the world? So like for me, I do communications work, I also do burlesque. Do these two things, how are they gonna work together or against me? Mm -hmm. How do I write online? You know, thinking about these things, and I think that this is becoming more of an issue for people across the board, not necessarily, uh, you know, as cut and dry, but how much of it is like, I can't put out my personal thoughts, beliefs, experiences, because it may affect my livelihood. Mm -hmm. Or I can't speak about X, Y, and Z on Twitter, I'll have two accounts. And then what does that do for your branding? What does that do for your voice? And then what does that actually do for community building? Mm -hmm. Because again, it's like you're having to pull back and you're not really able to express yourself in a way that's maybe ideal in terms of um, community building, that authenticity, the different kinds of viewpoints that you want to put out because it's always fearful like, well, is this going to affect my bottom line if I need to get paid or not? You know, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and what kind of evolution you've gone through on that or, you know, for, for everyone in the room if that's something that's coming up, particularly, you know, students, I'm not a student anymore, um, so it's, you know, a different space, but I'd love to hear thoughts about that. I think writing under a pseudonym can make a lot of sense for people who feel that they want to be participants in digital communities around issues they care about, but for some reason it's not going to fit with their day job or some other persona that they have that they have to maintain for their financial livelihood or for whatever else. Um, I think I've always been lucky enough to have full-time writing jobs that have allowed me to make my living as a writer, but I think for me on there's one issue that's so emotional for me that I've had to go in and out of the conversation, which is the issue of Israel-Palestine. Uh, for many years, I never wrote publicly about it because my feelings about it were in such contrast to how I was raised and some of the beliefs that my family has. And then um, in 2006, um, there was just a bunch of political events that happened that year where I really felt like I couldn't stay silent on it anymore, and so I started blogging more critically about being a young American Jew who sort of no longer considers myself a Zionist and what that means. And so it's sort of the, the emotional onslaught, it's, it's so hard for me to talk about and has been so difficult, but if you Google me and you Google Israel, you could see some of the stuff I've written. But that's a conversation that I've gone in and out of over the past six years because every time I dip into it, it is so emotionally exhausting. In my personal real world, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the ground life, as Courtney was joking before, I like that online, online verse on the ground. Um, it's difficult, but then it's also difficult online. But paradoxically, some of, some of the best community building I've done online has been the times that I've overcome my fears and have written publicly about Israel. Because when, for example, when I wrote an article about some of the messages that you get typically in American Jewish education in Hebrew schools and synagogues about Israel and how they, they counteract other social justice teachings that, that Jewish children are typically exposed to and how this leads a lot of Jewish children to grow up with a very kind of torn, um, fraught debate in their own minds. You know, I wrote about that and that was probably the single thing I wrote where I got the most just emails to me from people saying that they were glad somebody had said that. So I think that there are certain, certain times where you want to be going in and out of a debate, and you can't. That's a really important part of myself, but it's not always a part of myself that I want to be public with. I could be public with that maybe one month out of each year, <laughs> and then I have to sort of retreat on it because it's just too difficult. And I, that goes back to what I was saying before about offline time and online time. Let me add... Um one of the things that happens, um, so I wrote about sex uh, on the blog this summer. I write about sex and relationships. It was ugly. It was, um, it was real painful. I don't know that I fully recovered from that exchange, and it brought up lots of questions about being public, um, because when I first started writing as Crunktastic, no one knew who I was, but in some ways it sort of became more expedient because I do want to do more public work in my career to own some of the pieces that I was writing, so I made the choice to do it. But here, for me, the challenge became 
um, the, that part of what I wanted to name in choosing to write about sex as a black woman in a black feminist space is that black women struggle to find sex positive spaces for expression. So somebody has to own that we're having sex, that we like it, you know, all of those things, right, um, have to be a part of a black feminist ethic. Um, but there was a real steep price to pay for that, you know, whenever you do that and you're visible. And so one of the things I'm thankful for, some of you perhaps don't know that Renina is also actually a member of the CFC. And so when this happened, Renina writes much more eloquently um, and insightfully about sex and politics and, and all of it than I do. Um, and so, you know, she emailed me and said, you know, I got you. Like when, when this goes down in the comment section, I got you. So there was a post that went really, really terribly. And I, basically I was called a rapist. Uh, and, you know, and it was, and, and, and a lot of that had to do with like the inability to see black women as sexual agents, either we're predators or we're just asexual. Mm -hmm. And so trying to write in the interspace didn't go well with our readers. Mm -hmm. um, and the, what happens in the moment when there are things that are true for you, you write for this community, the community is pushing back against you and you say, this is my truth, I know it's true, I'm not backing off of it, even if it cost some readers, you know, I'm not gonna do it. Um, what does that look like or what does it mean to, to do that? Uh, and then, um, so, so in some ways I'm kind of in Dana's space now, so what I said was, all right, you know, I've done it, it's there, but I'm like, I'll write about flowers and happy <laughs> for like the next Sweet year. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. That's it. That's about as close to a body politic that I'm going that I'm going to write about anymore. Like uh, at least for a while. And so I think it's important to say that this thing about not being able to fully be yourself is real, and it it manifests in a different way depending on your positionality. And so to you know to write as a, you know, as a black woman about a sort of pro-sex consciousness from a feminist perspective is not as easy as one might think because mm. folks come with all these assumptions about who you should be and who they want you to be and what your interactions should look like. And frankly, a lot of times it's too because folks haven't done their own emotional labor mm. and, then they, and then they put their stuff on you. And so you have, to, it's like, you know, I was like, you know, you either got, you got to have a therapist plus community <laughs> plus a journal, you know, you got to have a whole range of self-care strategies in order yes. to be okay. Yes. But at the end of the day, we do this work because we want it to, because it should be life sustaining and affirming. Mm -hmm. And so when it isn't that, I can sort of honestly admit that I don't always manage that well. I don't always know what to do because I'm deeply invested in the work. I do take it to bed with me. It mm -hmm. does bother me. Mm -hmm. It has made me cry, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think we have to be able to say, again, what I said earlier, there are people behind the words. There are people behind the content. And, and figuring out how to honor that has been a real challenge. Mm -hmm. I know there are other questions I just wanted to add really quickly. Um, and I really, and this is highlighted by what fellow panelists have said, I have so much respect for the people who are able to move closer. I mean, I know it's not a, it's not a complete like, oh, we're missing, mission accomplished, you're there. But I have so much respect for those people who I see in digital spaces who clearly are doing that work of bringing all of who they are. And that's very apparent and it's very inspiring to me personally. Um, just following up on the question, that idea of different jobs and different roles and how that affects it, I think that's definitely real. Again, when I was like asking around and getting this feel for like what social, what my entry into social media was gonna look like, you're like, oh, they didn't mention like academic models on Twitter, like you should be like this person, that person, that person. And I'm like, they're all boring. <laughs> like, you know, other people like just tweet where they're gonna be talking and like tweet other people saying how awesome they are. And like, I'm like, yeah. So, but I think there was a real cult of respectability around that, around like mm -hmm. how one is supposed to comport oneself and how you're supposed to look. And I'm like, I've worked so hard to be able to come this far and I didn't want to put on like a tweed jacket online and like patches and stuff, <laughs> like, like what's the point, right? So mm -hmm. there's that. But I think the thing that I've been thinking about in regards to this also has been that while the public nature and kind of like the wide open spaces that, that social media represents is awesome in a lot of ways. I am find myself repeatedly and I think as like I look back at the historian historically there's been a need for private space. I'm mm -hmm. about some covert action. 
Mm. I'll just leave it at that. It's being recorded. But <laughs> <laughs> there's a necessity, a relevance of covert action in private conversation. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great to have that private conversation with people in a variety of spaces, you know, or even just as modest as I needed to have some private conversations about Beast of the Southern Wild. Mm. Because, uh, well, that's another, that's another panel perhaps. But um, um, <laughs> so the kind of expansive nature and the fact that everyone's participating and sharing and the possibility that, you know, someone could take a picture and it could be around the world in a minute is great. But there's also closing out the possibility of, a, of private spaces where a lot of important, a lot of the work that I think a lot of us on this panel, a lot of us in the audience would consider particularly important has happened in private and semi-private spaces. Mm -hmm. And those spaces are endangered mm -hmm. in many regards. We, we probably only have time for a couple more questions. So maybe, um, if we, maybe we could stack them and then the panelists could respond um, to whatever they would like to. to I want to first of all thank all of you because this has been a really vibrant and extraordinary conversation. And as an older generation feminist, I can honestly say I've been really skeptical of what's happening in social media for a lot of reasons. One, most of us are all behind screens and no longer in the streets. Mm -hmm. That said, I also know that the street is not the place it was many years ago. It's basically been made a very difficult place to occupy and retain any kind of credibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So with that said, I also worry very much in social media that there's a fine line between this uh, human need for recognition that was so eloquently put, and yet this failure to do the personal work. This kind of transference from one domain of media and entertainment to this new format of interaction where we're kind of looking for our Oprah moment so that we all get someone to answer our version of our drama. Mm. And that becomes something quite different than validation and recognition, which I also see. I mean, I can honestly mm -hmm. say I've inadvertently been through a seven-year international immigration hassle that kept me out of the country. So I've had seven years of being completely isolated without my language base or my community of New Yorkers, not to be replaced by anybody else in the world. And so I've had this ex very extreme experience of sort of living vicariously through what I could see and what I experienced. Mm -hmm. And there's something phenomenal about connecting and being with your people, even via internet, mm -hmm. even when you want more than that. But it's extraordinarily satisfying. But I do see when I do enter the blog sphere that oftentimes the comments and the exchange, there's, there's sort of this great divide between an enormous amount of sincerity and you just feel people just, you know, getting this good stuff and then this crazy place of hostility mm -hmm. and, of, and of screaming and carrying on or just wanting that kind of venting and all that energy on the part of each of you as a kind of, um, personal response team. And so we, I think what's happened is our, our whole range of expectations has become socially unsustainable, to use the language of sustainability. That in the midst of needing more and more community and more and more human interaction and more and more understanding. So I'm trying to ask some kind of question about what's the nature of this, um, this, de this desire for personal stimulation and interaction and how does that relate to maybe a place where we now, certainly in, you know, in the industrial world, have this idea that all of our personal expectations should and must be satisfied. Mm. And is that legitimate? Because certainly that's something very, very difficult to attain. And, I'm just sort of interested in how you would think about those things. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's, let's take uh, one more question from the audience and then the panelists which have sort of one opportunity to respond to whatever they uh, see fit. We only have about 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Can we do two? Are there two more questions? Oh, okay. Thanks. I'm just hoping that you all can talk about Twitter gate at least a little bit. And I'm curious the, the differences between um, the academics on the panel and the journalists on the panel and kind of what the responsibilities are as far as making public um, conversations that may be in progress. 
And do you want to summarize it a little bit for people who don't know about it? Because we keep referencing it, and I actually don't feel educated enough about it to summarize it, but I feel like there are probably people in the audience who have no idea what we're talking about. So will someone, when we get there, summarize? Okay. From what I understand, you're talking to strangers, and there's a lot of subjects that create emotional responses from people you don't know. You're talking to strangers. Mm -hmm. My question is, after you give your opinion on whatever the subject might be, and some crazy gives you a shot back, are you able to enjoy that shot and laugh about it, or do you feel hurt? <coughs> oh. <clears throat> okay, so um, I just, let's, why don't we just um, start uh, with Dana and, and move down the panelists, and you can respond to whatever you'd like. I'll take the last one first. Um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes crazy people get in touch with me. Usually if they seem really crazy, I just ignore it. Um, sometimes I feel hurt because the person has actually pointed out something that's missing in my writing that I should have been aware of. And those are those public learning moments that Courtney talked about at the beginning, which I so identify with. And then I have to take a step back and remind myself that I should thank this person for for getting in touch with me but you know i get a lot of emails and comments that i completely ignore because they don't seem um they're not rational or they're they have profanity in them or there's something else in them that that's just crazy i i have four rules on my blog comment section i think i can't remember off the top of my head exactly how i phrase it but there's no racism no sexism there's no comments on my physical appearance I had to make that rule because I was getting so many of that. Um, no anti-Semitism, which I had to do because my last name is Goldstein, so for some reason that attracts anti-Semites to my site. Um, and no profanity. So if you can follow those rules, I'll try to engage with you. But if you can't, then no. Um, so Twittergate, which I just read out, which I, which I just read up about uh, when Anne asked us to. Uh, it seems to be a debate among historians about whether or not it's okay to tweet their presentations of their unpublished papers and unpublished research findings. So if that's not an accurate summary, then please correct me. But I, I did think it was really interesting, and in part because I think journalists have been having some of the same debates about how much we show the notes of our reporting and should we publish online like full transcripts of our interviews that then make it into stories so that you can see quotes in context versus out of context. Um, and generally, I'm a supporter of full disclosure all the time for everything. I, I have learned so much from showing unfinished pieces of my work publicly that I, I can only imagine that academics would also learn a lot from that process. I think if you're at an event where a speaker says, I would prefer that you not tweet this presentation. It should obviously be totally respected. Um, I think absent a sort of explicit conversation about this, you can't really know how someone should feel. So I think if you're hosting an event as an institution or an organization or an individual, you should set some ground rules at the beginning. But ultimately, I think, I think work is improved by a public conversation about, about it and reaction to it. Thanks, Renina. With, with regard to the issue of Twittergate, I think what's material is this idea of taking someone's original knowledge production and making it public without their consent, right? Um, but then the question then becomes, who is this intended for and for what purpose and why is it private, right? So, Honestly, I don't know how one will be able, how we will be able to keep the things that we publish off of the internet. In terms of reading about a conversation um, within the digital humanities, one of the things that someone brought up that I hadn't thought about is that there's a difference between me speaking to you all right now or me handing my paper to everyone and it being searchable on Google by everyone in the world, 
right? So you have this idea of a conversation in this room, and then there's paper copies, and then there's Google. So that searchability piece, I think it adds another nuance to it in terms of being able to control um, as a scholar, as a blogger, your own sort of intellectual labor. So I don't know what's going to come of that, but I know that the internet is incredibly powerful and people love using social media. <clears throat> um, I, I don't feel like the best one to comment on Twittergate. I will say I'm working, I work with an organization called the Op-Ed Project, which is trying to make forms of thought leadership exactly mirror the demographic of the United States, so you can imagine how much work is yet to be done there. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I run the Yale University program, so I have 20 professors who have applied to be in who are either women or people of color, men of color. And um, I, it's amazing to me as a non-academic, we were talking a little bit about this before, like the amount of fear mm -hmm. that they have and that they've internalized even when they have tenure has just blown me away. And, and you know, it's, I think, you know, I'm so glad Brittany's writing about it. I feel like there's such an important conversation about the academy and what it does to people and how they feel they have to be so protective of their intellectual property and how the rest of us lose out um, because of that. I mean, I've had these incredible professors who I can't get to write anything for a popular audience because they're just so afraid of what that means for them, um, which just makes me incredibly sad. And I'm not an expert on the academy, so I say that as like a naive journalist type person. Um, I just want to introduce one word that we haven't said yet, which I think is really important, which is friendship. Um, like digital communities, any communities are the you know sum total of friendships ostensibly, right? And I was thinking about your great question about slut walk and sort of what was learning, and I just feel like one of the places where feedback and kind of growth dies on the vine is when there aren't genuine friendships. Mm -hmm. That the context in which those things are happening aren't within genuine friendships and. Friendship is hard, man. I mean, and, and even feedback within friendships that have nothing to do with political stuff is really hard, right? Like, when was the last time you actually gave a friend feedback and it went well, or received feedback and it went well? So I just think this culture, we have such struggle with genuine feedback, and, and also we struggle to be friends across all kinds of demographic barriers. Um, so the more that we can think about this in the context of friendship and, like, how do we create friendships so that I can call Brittany if something happens online mm -hmm. because I know we have a genuine respect for one another in person and, and in the context of that as opposed to it all being kind of online and for the movement and all this stuff that feels like makes it very difficult to genuinely process feedback and integrate it. So just want to end on that. Yeah, I think being in community and having genuine relationships are really important because it leads to a certain accountability. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when folks say this is what you should be doing or talking about and they want their personal kind of agenda to become yours, then I have folks that I check in with about mm -hmm. how to retain my sense of what's important to me and what's important to us. Um, Twittergate, there's a lot, of, a lot to say about it. I will say, here's the funny part. I was at this conference where this, <laughs> and I didn't know that this whole thing had happened because I've been like trying to rest. Uh, and um, so I think I will write about it, but what I, my sense of it is that one of the things we wanna do with the CFC is to really challenge these academic barriers that tell us to be afraid to, to, to not share, that it devalues the work. So I, at this point, am about democratizing. And one of the things that I think we have to acknowledge is that in some ways, this is where the culture is moving. When I graduated in 2009, they were like, oh, we're gonna just put your dissertation in the electronic dissertation repository, and so people can Google that next month the whole dissertation and download it via PDF. Mm -hmm. And so every year I have to like put these embargoes out because I'm like, is anyone gonna publish my book if they can read, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. But so that is where the culture of academia is going, th this sort of open access kind of thing. Um, but I, but part of this is about uh, wanting to make sure that folks who don't ever make it to like the Asala conference, which is where this happened, um, can hear about their history and know about, you know, so there might be folks who've never even heard Polly Murray's name unless someone tweeted from one of the panels mm -hmm. that she's important. And if you don't know who she is, go Google her. She's a person you should know. And, and the teacher in me wants that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
On the other hand, I also know that intellectual property is fragile. We had a woman from Kenya steal, just steal half of a blog post and publish it in a news, a print newspaper there this month, in September. And when you know people were emailing us saying, this Kenyan woman stole your stuff, and we were like, first of all, we got all these readers in Kenya? Well, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, you know, Thank global black feminisms, you know? And then. Global crime. <laughs> yes, I love it. Put that on a t-shirt. Uh, uh, but then, when we sort of, and we just emailed them and said, can y'all just put a link to the original post? That's all we want you to do. We're not tripping. And this girl was like, I didn't steal anything from the internet. You can't steal from the internet. Huh. The internet is like my band, you know, sort of, you know. She, and we were like, what are you talking about, chick? Like, that's ridiculous. But, you know, so, so I think that the other thing that's happened is that when things are on the internet, people have a different ethic about what they can do with it. Right. Now, all of a sudden, you know, they think, well, it's just like listening to this song I like. But I, I think the last thing that I will say about this, though, with, is particularly as a person who thinks about these things in terms of black women's experiences, I don't know that black women have ever had the luxury of doing knowledge production in a way that wasn't public. I think that everything that we do for good or ill has been public, has been considered the property of someone else. I and I think that the power in that, despite the history of exploitation that it comes from, is that we have always acknowledged that and then decided that if that were the case, we're gonna use it to transform communities that we have access to. So since I'm not convinced that black women are gonna get this deep private sphere anytime soon, that's really gonna be protected and people are gonna respect it, um, then I'm, I'm sort of committed to the notion that Let's make it public on our own terms, and that's what social media gives us the possibility of doing, putting out content on our own terms. Um, and, and, and I think that that can be empowering if we do it in the right ways. Man, so much, so much. Um, just to respond to the questions a bit, um, do you feel better after you kind of respond to this stranger? Sometimes, yes, and usually, me personally, I mean, not that I've been in that situation nearly as much as, as these women, but usually I'm proud of myself for the extent to which I'm able to kind of take a certain kind of high road, you know? Like, you came at me with curse words and, you know, like, excuse me, like, do I know you? Like, where did you come from with this? And I'm able to kind of, like, bring some of what I know, make it a teachable moment in the midst of all the F-bombs. I'm actually going to bring, in that moment, bring a little of who I like to think of myself. You know, like, I'm not going to go to your level. I'm not going to... I'm not gonna be reactionary in that way. So sometimes that is satisfying, you know, that you can just kind of like do the deep breath and come from a place that you can feel proud of. So that is sometimes the case. Respond to what you were saying, I too, maybe because like I'm that forgotten generation known as Gen X, that, you know, is not necessarily in what we think of as a millennial kind of willingness to share and not kind of like, what the hell is the internet kind of space. You know, I too feel a real concern around um, the ways in which digital community can be seen as a filling in for a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the people who was also frustrated with the streets because I like wanted the streets to be like, don't bring me to a rally if you don't give me an agenda item for what comes next in terms of moving this issue forward. And I feel the same way with a lot of stuff that goes on online. So, and also people have a sense, just like they do at the rally, like I'm back from Union Square, I helped. Like, I signed the petition, I helped. I forwarded the Coney video, God help us, I helped. <laughs> you know? Oh, you so I think Coney. it really needs to be in both, of these, in both of these situations about that act of translation. And again, that larger web in which these um, activities really need to be viewed. Um, Twittergate, gee. Um, I will say, um, as a historian, that I do feel there's a little bit more to it. I think it gets a little extreme, so it's like those old fogey private academic types don't want to, mm. you know, accept that it's a new day is dawned and they got to get with the program. I do think it's a little more than that. Um, I am very torn about it. I think that for me, again, it's about not just the way, not just that information is going to be flowing. We can, we can appreciate that as, to whatever degree of the social good. But I think also it's, again, about <clears throat> a certain prioritizing of 
the room that we're in now, the space that we're in. I'm connecting with your faces. I'm seeing what you're saying and the energy I'm getting from you and hopefully you're getting from us. And while I hope that some of that is accessible to the people who are watching it, it's not necessarily my priority. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's often different for me if the people I'm talking to aren't looking at me, aren't, aren't mm -hmm. participating in that energy, they're channeling that energy into some other device, into some other screen. And the conversations I think we might have could be different as a result of that. So me, I thought that I sucked at live tweeting, but I actually am just not a fan of it. I'm like, you're like slightly retro tweet girl. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take my pen and paper notes and I'm going to tweet it up afterwards, mm -hmm. you know? So that's kind of the middle ground that I've found. But I think that ideas of how we come together in, in, as academics and share and connect with each other <clears throat> really need to be prioritized. And I think part of what's hard about Twittergate is not just you're going to steal my stuff and make a million dollars because scholars are not making a million dollars, <laughs> you know? It's really about the moment and... Um, and that this is a culture not of monetizing as it is as much about attribution and about kind of um, a structure, a scaffolding of ideas. And what happens, like why is it that on one level we can celebrate and want to protect the academy as a space where complicated thought is still has a space, that's still a, a, a good in the academy, and then turn around and be shocked when those same people take issue with the fact that you did some on the fly 140 character translation of what you said while you were saying it, and at times before your sentence or paragraph is through. So while I'm really, uh, while I was somebody who didn't get to go to the conference and was like, more tweets, more tweets, y'all, <laughs> you know, like literally that was, I was like, oh man, did I, I pardon Twittergate. Um, even though I really do respect that kind of public service aspect of it, I think also we need to be realistic and see it as a service to other academics and other scholars and perhaps graduate students that don't have the time or money to make it to these conferences, but not to pretend that those tweets are the same as bringing academic scholarship to wider public circles. That work needs to be done. It's a particular kind of work and I want us to do it, and I don't want, again, this kind of digital space to be like, oh, I brought it to the masses, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, that, I think the kind of work of, um, it was mentioned about writing for different venues, being willing to um, write, your, write your books in a different kind of way and not have to wait till your three books past tenure to do so, um, is where we need to give our attention, and I get concerned when we pat ourselves on the back for um, a certain relationship to all this. <clears throat> Okay, well, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I just want to thank all the panelists for a fantastic discussion. This is to be continued online and in real life and in all the spaces between. So thanks, everybody. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much.